Greetings, urban farmers, gardeners, and healthy food visionaries. Farmer Greg here, and welcome to the 528th episode of the Urban Farm Podcast, where every day we work together to educate and inspire you to become part of your food revolution. Have you thought about why you do what you do? This is a daily process for me, and it is the reason I put so much energy and money into producing our Urban Farm Podcast. What you may not know is that it costs $158 per episode to get you this incredible information. And as you can hear, we don't do sponsorships as we want to keep our message as clean as possible. It has always been my intent to pay for our podcast production with our online content sales, and that hasn't worked very well. So we're trying something new, and I need your help so that we can continue delivering this great content. And quite honestly, this is an easy learning-filled request. I've teamed up with some amazing gardening visionaries to host a free online edible backyard summit the week of March 23rd. When you attend, you'll get free access for the week to the knowledge of these food growing experts and have an opportunity to get your burning questions answered live. Plus, we're going to release five modules of our comprehensive Growing Food the Basics course so that you can dig deeply into the fundamental concepts that will set you up for success no matter where you're at in your food growing journey. So here's what I need. The most helpful thing you can do is to share our EdibleBackyardSummit.com page far and wide with your friends, on social media, in your garden clubs, and probably places we've never even thought about. Next, please attend the free Edible Backyard Summit. My hope is that some of you will dive in, support our work, and purchase the extended summit and learn more about gardening and creating your own edible backyard. Our intent with this edible backyard summit is for you to discover how you can truly thrive with a healthy life and get reconnected with your food while learning how to live a more self-reliant life, feeling secure knowing that you have a food supply right in your backyard. When you attend the Edible Backyard Summit, you'll be part of a community of people from around the world that are all on a mission to make their backyards and patios into an edible paradise. Whether you're starting your first garden or maintaining an existing one, you will come out of this summit feeling revitalized and re-inspired to make growing and eating food the celebration it should be. Sign up for free by going to ediblebackyardsummit.com or texting BACKYARD to 33444. I look forward to seeing you there. Today on our podcast, we have someone who is transforming the food systems of the world through good seeds and sustainable practices. We're talking with Jane Rabinowitz about global seed work. Jane was appointed as executive director of Seed Change in 2016 after joining the organization in 2011. Jane has dedicated her career to community-led change. She is co-founder of the Silver Dollar Foundation and serves on the board of directors of Tides Canada. Jane was named one of the 53 most influential people in Canada's food system by the Globe and Mail and one of Canada's leading women changing the way we eat by Chantelaine Magazine. Welcome to the show today, Jane. Are you ready to rock seeds? I'm always ready to rock seeds. Excellent. So I shared a bit about you. Can you fill in the blanks for us and share more about the path you took to get where you're at today? Sure. And thanks for your interest. I think from a very young age, I kind of recognized the power of food for transformation. I started volunteering in community gardens and in soup kitchens in high school. I was always a passionate cook. I think I knew also at a pretty young age that I wanted to dedicate my life to service in some form. And I think you know, for, for community empowerment and for environmental stewardship, food is one of the most powerful vehicles that we have. So yeah, so I, I studied urban food security and food systems. I was volunteering for Meals on Wheels for, for many years. And so at the local level, at the at the provincial level, at the national level, and then now at the international level, my passion has always been food as a driver for change. Nice. Tell me, what is Seed Change? Seed Change is one of Canada's longest standing and progressive international cooperation organizations. We were founded in 1945 as the Unitarian Service Committee of Canada by a uh, Czech refugee named Dr. Lada Hichmanova. So Lada had survived the Second World War and was actually, her life was saved by the Unitarian Service Committee of Boston. And then she relocated to Canada and founded 
USC Canada with a mission to help rebuild the cities and support the children of post-war Europe. And over the years, the work of USC Canada evolved. And so we were running development projects in Asia, Africa, Latin America, and working in rural communities. Again, you realize that you cannot support long-term development and the betterment of grassroots communities unless you go through agriculture. So the, 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 the majority of the world's rural populations are farmers. And so USC Canada started uh, seeing the powerful combination of local seed and local knowledge for long-term change that really began to become the thrust of our work uh, in Ethiopia in the 1980s during the famine when we were partnering with the National Gene Bank in Ethiopia and local farmers and NGOs to save seed diversity, spread that seed, that seed diversity across Ethiopia um, and support local farmer knowledge around plant genetic diversity for long-term food security. Again, in Honduras, after Hurricane Mitch, just seeing the devastation to the food system, the devastation uh, to local communities, we saw the powerful combination of local seed and local knowledge to rebuild for the long term. And so, again, that powerful combination for long-term survival, for long-term food sovereignty after a crisis. And that became, became our mission, um, officially adopted in 2007. And then just, just last year in uh, 2019, on the eve of our 75th anniversary, we changed changed our name from USC Canada to Seed Change to officially reflect the organization that we've become today. Wow. So you're primarily doing seed work. Yep. Our focus is food sovereignty through seed biodiversity, agroecology, and farmer leadership. Wow. How exciting is that to play in that arena, huh? <laughs> I mean, I got to say, I'm, I'm pretty, I feel pretty lucky and I'm very, very fortunate to do the work that, that you know, going to, for, for me, going to work every day is about, you know, saving seed diversity and supporting farmer leadership. And I feel incredibly privileged to do that work. Nice. Can you introduce us to Lada, the founder of this, and what was her vision for making the world a better, kinder place? Lada Hitchmanova. I mean, I think the best way to describe Lada Hitchmanova was a force of nature. <laughs> <laughs> I never had the 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 the, ple the pleasure of meeting her, but. Um, I've heard stories from long-term seed change supporters about L Lada. She was, I would describe her as tiny but mighty. She was short in stature, but big in impact. And as I said earlier, she had survived the Second World War. She was Jewish, relocated uh, to Canada. And I think she was, you know, she had experienced atrocity in her own life. And she was an educated person. She was a driven person. She was a professional. And she decided to spend the rest of her life when she was established in Canada, devoted to supporting others who found themselves through no action of their own in very challenging circumstances. She had a massive impact on Canadians. She inspired people coast to coast to generously donate money, to donate goods, and to donate their time to communities who were, you know, facing challenging, um, you know, situations overseas. She spent about half of her year on the road internationally visiting programs, and then she would spend the other half of her year on the road in Canada visiting Canadian communities and talking about what she had seen and galvanizing communities to, to lend a hand to make a difference. At one point in time, the Seed Change head office address at 56 Spark Street was the second best known address in the country, second to the Prime Minister's residence. And Lotta was a household name, so really a Canadian icon, a huge part of our history and I think a legacy that we build on today that we're very, very proud of. Wow. And so you're working with seeds, not just in Canada, but globally. Tell me, tell me about your seed programs. So we currently work with about 35,000 farmers directly and about 150 of their family members in 13 countries in Asia, Africa, Latin America, and Canada. The foundation of our work is participatory research, so working with communities to map their seed system, understand the diversity that exists, understand the diversity that's been lost, understand what the, how the climate is changing, what their seed needs are, and then work with those communities to, in some cases, save seeds that are on the brink of extinction, in some cases, breed new varieties through participatory plant breeding, that are locally adapted and bred for low input farming and where farmers have the right to save and replant those seeds. We support policy and advocacy work by grassroots organizations to defend farmers' rights to save seed 
and then also to register farmer bred varieties. And we also work uh, to promote and spread agroecological farming more broadly. So again, farming in harmony with nature and supporting supporting communities to, to grow with the resources and knowledge that they have. So I always ask our guests to send us a list of questions. And one of the questions you sent over is, why does this even matter? <laughs> And we said that. <laughs> I, perhaps. I mean, it's sitting here in front of me. And I believe you. It's it's almost one of those answers that's an of course, but let's go ahead yeah. and di- let's dig in there because why does all this matter? I think that sometimes now, now we are seeing, we're, we're a few years into the kind of rise of awareness around the importance of local food and the importance of sustainable food. So mm-hmm. you know, that now it seems like a given, but that wasn't always the case. So a lot of effort has been put in by a lot of really amazing people at the community level and at different levels to kind of advocate for sustainable local food systems. And that work has now, I think we can agree that it's now broken into the mainstream. The next level out around seed is some is for some people a little bit more difficult to connect to because it's hard for an everyday consumer to make that link between you know the seed and then the food and then what does this have to do with my life but as soon as you make that connection when you say you know the vast majority of the food that we eat today starts with the seed <laughs> right you know the vast majority of the seeds that are grown are bred to perform best with high fossil fuel emission inputs and chemical inputs that we also know are toxic to human health and toxic to the environment. The whole way in which our seed system is oriented is about this kind of, you know, high input, high emissions production system that we know is is, is not working. So I think it can be difficult for people to make the connection between, you know, my everyday life, my health, my well-being, the well-being of my family, the food that I eat and the seed that grows that food. But once you make that connection, all of the food that we eat starts with a seed and the way in which that seed is grown, the way in which that seed is bred has massive implications on our health and our environment. The light bulb goes off and then it doesn't go <laughs> and then it does it stays on for the rest of your life. You're, yeah. you know, you're down, you're down the rabbit hole of seed of, <laughs> of, of, of seed passion for the rest of your life. Yeah, that's interesting. A lot of nooks and crannies here at the urban farm have seeds that I've saved. In fact, I think my sweetie Heidi rolls her eyes a little bit when she finds another packet of seeds that I've thrown in a Ziploc bag and that I saved from something in the yard. So I understand Mm -hmm. that passion. Mm -hmm. Well, and seeds, you know, so you can start by saying the vast majority of the food that we eat today is grown from a seed, but then, so obviously there's a massive food security uh, impact, but and there's a massive environmental impact and there's a massive economic impact. But there's also that, I don't want to say spiritual necessarily, but just that human element of seed where you talk about the story goes with the seed and seeds mm-hmm. are passed from generation from to, to generation. And, you know, our food traditions are, are carried through seed. And in a lot of uh, communities around the world, it's women who are the seed savers and the seed stewards. And it's a, a really powerful role that women play in community. And so... You know, the seed is powerful for so many different reasons. I say seed has been, you know, my greatest teacher, <laughs> which is maybe a little bit cheesy. But again, once you get, once you realize and once you start to think a little bit about seed, you realize how incredibly powerful it is. Yeah. And so one of the things, some friends of mine, Bill McDormand, Bell Starr, Kari Spencer, and I started an organization a while back called the Great American Seed Up. And it was designed to supercharge our local food and seed economy. And, you know, I I mentioned that to you and you had some great thoughts on the impact of grassroots, really all grassroots projects around food. Can you dig into that a little bit? I think, you know, what excites me about grassroots seed projects are that urban farmers and backyard gardeners in in their seed saving have a lot more tolerance to risk than a large scale farmer. Mm -hmm. Um, A large scale farmer really, you know, their, their bottom line is about their harvest and they can't put that up to chance. And that's where we get into growing crops that are highly uniform. And in our, you know, commercial seed and food system, there isn't a huge amount of diversity, but there is a massive amount of diversity in backyard gardens and urban gardens and urban farms. 
And so I think of those gardeners and those farmers as really on the front lines of diversity conservation. And that's really important for the food that we eat today. But it also is critically important for the food that we're going to eat tomorrow, because who knows what traits we're going to need, what genetic traits we're going to need to survive new pests, new diseases, et cetera, that come with climate change. And, and that genetic diversity is tied up in the seeds. So the role that community gardens, that grassroots seed savers and grassroots seed projects play in saving seed diversity and keeping that seed diversity as widely accessible as possible is just so, so, so important. So I really, I'm, I'm very passionate about it. Uh -huh. <laughs> I get very excited about it. And then you think about how amazing it is when those grassroots projects are networked up with each other um, and are sharing resources and knowledge with each other. There's a lot of kind of grassroots seed saving um, initiatives that have developed how-to guides on different kinds of seed saving practices. And um, folks are dealing with a lot of, you know, obviously climates, you know, and weather conditions and environments, you know, very place to place, but there's a lot of kind of basics that, that folks have, you know, figured out and, and developed kind of how-to resources for. And so I think it's really important when grassroots seed saving projects are networked with each other and are sa sharing knowledge and resources. And then I also think it's really important when grassroots seed saving projects are connected to more institutional kind of diversity conservation institutions like national seed banks. So in the case of Canada, our national seed bank is in Saskatoon. We have an incredible collection of mostly cereal crops, which you can understand given our <laughs> country. Yep. And our national seed bank is not able to renew the, co the collection at the speed that it would need to to keep all of the seeds viable. And it relies on organizations like Seeds of Diversity Canada, which is an amazing network of backyard seed savers um, and other grassroots seed projects to access our seeds from the National Gene Bank, grow out those seeds and return, return some of them back to the gene bank. And so I think of seed saving on a spectrum. On the one end, you have high purity, high security. You know, you can think about the Svalbard, you know, doomsday yeah. vault, you know, just, you know, that kind of like keep those seeds secure and make sure that they're very, very high quality and very, you know, true to type and pure. And then on the other end of the spectrum, you have you know, less quality control, but high diversity and high public access. And, and then you've got everything in between. And all of those activities are extremely important in terms of saving seed diversity and keeping that diversity adapting and circulating. When you're doing work in your organizations at a grassroots level, plus a top down level, so you're, you're doing it on both sides of the coin. I'm, I'm not a fan of top down. It's it doesn't move fast enough for me. So you have to really have uh -huh. patience to work with agencies and governments and that kind of stuff. And you're doing work on both sides of that coin. Yeah, our work at the at the policy level, as you say, I, it is it is slower. It's highly bureaucratic. But what you realize is that the policies that are set at the national level and at international levels with with international treaties, for example, the International Treaty on Plant Genetic Resources for Food and Agriculture, the Convention on Biological Diversity, etc. Those policies, those regulations, have massive impacts on the farmers that we work that we work with on the day to day. So that's where policy is set in terms of the right to save seed and the right to share seed, which seeds are recognized. You know, if they're seeds that come from the, the so-called, you know, formal sector or if they're seeds that have been bred and saved and passed um, along by farmers for generations. So you can't deny. I also would want to write off, you know, <laughs> that participating in those kinds of, you know, spaces because no. I'm also like a doer. But you can't deny the impact of decisions that are made at that level on the farmers that we're working with in rural communities around the world on the day to day. Um, and so we're there. And what we try to do is we allocate most of our resources to work in the field directly with farmers. And then we also allocate some of our resources to supporting policy work that's happening at national and international levels. And the primary focus of our, of our interventions at those scales are specifically supporting farmer voices so that they are able to advocate for themselves. Wow. So literally, you're teaching a farmer how to farm and advocate for themselves. I mean, I, I, don't, I wouldn't say we're teaching farmers anything. <laughs> um, <laughs> well, there but, they uh, go. That's true. <laughs> but, you know, we're working with farmers who are facing uh, tremendous adversity, be it in, you know, being placed for different reasons in, you know, very marginal growing conditions, being 
you know, marginalized for a number of different reasons. And, and there's a lot of s- structural and systemic barriers that the growers that we work with face on the day to day. So what we try to do is recognize and acknowledge their work. And if we can help to dismantle some of those barriers together. Nice. So I want you to think about the past eight years that you've been with this organization and go back to one moment that you knew that this was the reason you were doing this. Do you have one of those for us? One moment when I knew this was the reason. I think for me, as a non-farmer, as, as I mean, you're, you're a farmer, so maybe this isn't something that you've experienced. But for me, you know, of course, there's, you get a bit of an inferiority complex. Or what is it? Um, the imposter syndrome. Yeah. Like, you know, who, who am I you know, <laughs> to be talking about any of this with, and trying to, you know, create something with people who are doing this every all day, day every day, yep. you know, and in some cases, in many cases for people who, for whom, you know, this has been their livelihood for generations. So for me, like the moment was just hearing in a very, very simple way, hearing from a grower who I respect to the utmost that the program that I had designed, uh, because I developed Seed Change's first ever Canadian field program, so our first ever kind of effort to work with Canadian farmers, that the program that I had put together in consultation with growers across the country and with researchers and others made sense and was going to be supportive for the seed saving community in Canada. For me, that was like, wow, that was it. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I was like, I've arrived. <laughs> I, yeah. I thought you were going to go another direction with that. that okay. you, you created the program and they thought it wasn't going to help. Oh, <laughs> no. I mean, my whole, as, as you know, going back to, you know, my origin story or whatever, I just, my, my passion is if I can just use my skills, my talents, you know, my hands, my brain, my feet, whatever, whatever I have to offer to just to be of service in, in some way. And so to hear from people who I respect and who I'm trying to support that that is something that we're doing. And also that, you know, there's, there's, a, there's an interaction between folks who are, who are farming all day, every day, and then folks like me who are trying to support them, who are able to offer different things. And so just to, just to know that the way that we've put things together and the way that we've designed things is in fact supportive, is, is in fact in service and, and complementary to what they're doing and to their leadership, nothing, for, for me, nothing could be more important. Nice. Good on you. How can our <laughs> listeners participate? Yeah, so uh, how to participate in our work or how to support our work, I would say first you can check us out at weseedchange.org. Follow us on Twitter, on Instagram, on Facebook. Uh, you can find us using We Seed Change as our handle. You can donate to support Seed Change. All of the donations that we that we receive, and we don't survive without donations from uh, the general public, uh, go directly to support our work with farmers uh, internationally and across Canada. And I think to participate, we're going to be doing more and more campaigns. So we've got two campaigns that will be coming up in the year ahead. One is related to farming climate solutions. So looking at the intersection between agriculture and climate and how agriculture can be a vehicle for climate solutions if we support farmer leadership and climate friendly practices. And so to sign on to support and amplify that campaign. And then we'll also be running a campaign in the year ahead that's related to protecting farmers' rights to save seed. Awesome. So that is we seedchange.org. You can go there and find out all about the organization. We'll talk more about that in a little while too. So I'm going to shift on you and I'd like for you to talk about a time you failed, how you overcame that failure and what you might have learned from it. So it's always difficult to talk about failures. In reflecting on this question, for me, I think the biggest failure, the thing that that really that really sticks with me or that you know, what keeps me up at night is, is, is when I left, let people down or if I let people down and making big decisions without informing people first or without engaging people in the right way. And so for me, my biggest failures have been connected to letting people down. Mm. Um, when I, when I could have made when together, maybe we could have come up with a, a solution together. That kind of failure is a little bit difficult to overcome because it just sticks with you forever. (laughs) But the way that the most respect that we can give our failures is to commit to learn from them. 
And so, and in, in particular, if we've, if, if through our failures, we've let people down, then the best way to respect those people is to learn from what we did and make sure that we don't repeat it. And so in particular, in a leadership position, I think it's really important to note that process really is as important as outcome. And sometimes we can think, oh, you know, heavy processes, they really slow us down and I don't want to consult anymore. And I don't want to, you know, this, that, and the other, but I think if you take a second to think about what would it mean to do this properly and respectfully, oftentimes it doesn't mean adding that much more time, but your outcome is probably going to be improved and people are probably going to feel better about it. Amen to that. In fact, this is the reason, that was a perfect answer, by the way. This is the reason I asked this question because, you know, so often we look at at failure as a failure. I did something bad or wrong. Mm -hmm. and. For me, looking at failure as my way to learn, it makes me a better person. Yeah, it's hard because you just wish, you know, for me, it's just like a hind, you know, hindsight is twenty twenty. I'm not someone, I don't know how much you, you've, you can glean from this short conversation, but I don't love failure. Uh-huh. <laughs> I'm not someone who's super into failure. So I would prefer not to make the mistakes in the first place. But <laughs> again, it is, I think, yeah, looking at failure as, it is, it is the, the best way for us to learn, yeah. for sure. Amen for sure. That. And what do you consider your biggest success? My biggest success is probably the flip side of, my, of, of the failure. So for me, my, biz, my biggest successes have been helping to steward diverse groups to create big shared ambitions and then work together to achieve them. And I think that that kind of collective energy and that kind of, and then, you know, you kind of together give birth to something amazing. I just, I love it. And I think it can, it can come out there for, in my own kind of experience, it has manifested in in a number of different ways. I used to be executive director of a local Meals on Wheels. It was a youth run Meals on Wheels and we delivered meals by bike to seniors across the city. And we rented and we were renting in this kind of run down, you know, cold, freezing cold in the winter, boiling hot in the summer, just kind of brutal space. And a lot of community organizations do their work out of spaces like that. And I think there's a general belief that, well, if you're a charity, (laughs) then you could, you should be working in, you know, a not so great (laughs) work environment because Mm -hmm. it's cheaper. But we took the belief that, you know, the quality of our work is, is impacted by the quality of our space. And we wanted a space that was healthy and that was, that reflected our mission and our vision. And that was an inspiring space for volunteers and for staff. And so together, staff and board and community members, and again, this was a small scale grassroots Meals on Wheels organization that was run by young people, ran, set out a major vision to buy a building that would serve as our long, long-term home and to run a capital campaign to raise the funds to buy that building and we did it. And nice. the, or, the, or, yeah, the organization now operates from the space and it has room to grow. I met with their new executive director just a, a, a few weeks ago, and he was saying that the single most important resource that they have in terms of their vision for their long-term future is that building. Mm. And so it's going back a few, a few years now. I wanted to come up with a big, with a, you know, a different success, but I was 25 years old. It was my first executive director job. I had no idea what I was doing, but I was just like, let's go for it. Apparently yeah, you still, did. Yeah. <laughs> it's one of the proudest things I've ever done. Yeah, good job. And what drives you? I think what drives me is, it is really to put my, whatever I have to offer, whatever time I have, whatever skill I have, whatever talents I have to just do what I can with the time that I have to just try to make a difference. And, you know, we spend so much of our lives working. So let's say, you know, you work nine to five or many of us, we work more than nine to five. That's right. a lot of, that's a, it's a lot of hours over a lot of years. Yeah. And so for me, it's just, what am I going to do with that time? And what am I going to do with my effort? And what am I going to do with my skill? And what drives me is just putting everything that I have to the best use that I can to do something positive. (laughs) Beautiful. And if you could recommend one book for our listeners, what would it be and why? Yes, I am very excited today to recommend an amazing book that I read uh, last year that is called A Mind A Mind Spread Out on the Ground. It was written by a young author uh, named Alicia Elliott, who is Tuscarora from Six Nations of the Grand River. 
And yeah, it's a book that'll stay with you. It's a book that will inspire you. It's a book that you will learn from um, about yourself, about what it is. Yeah, about, about, about yourself, about life, about indigeneity. Really, really incredible piece of work from Alicia Elliott. Nice. Called A Mind Spread Out on the Ground. That's right. Awesome. And what one final piece of advice do you have for our listeners? My final piece of advice is to find joy in the tough stuff that, you know, things can be hard and things can be difficult. And in particular, if you're, if, you know, if you're trying to make a, a difference in your community or in your family, in your organization, you know, wherever you are. And I think that, you know, folks can, we can all get overwhelmed by the doom and gloom of today. But if each of us do what we can, I think we can, I think we can turn this ship around. Yeah. And I also think that we should give ourselves the, I don't know what it is, the license or just, or just take the space to find joy in the challenge. And I think that when you're, when you find joy in difficult circumstances or when you find joy in being in service, that's when really incredible things can happen. Yeah. I think it's interesting that you said find joy, not happiness. No, because happiness to me is, I don't even know what happiness is. For me, joy is about a depth of experience. It's not about being happy. It's about a deep sense of meaning. And for me, joy is also most often experienced in relationship with other people. So I'm personally not in pursuit of happiness, but when I experience joy and particular joy in the work, for me, there's, there's nothing bigger. Awesome. Thank you so much for joining us on the show today, Jane. It's really been a pleasure. Thank you for the invitation. Yeah, you bet. It's been a great conversation. You did awesome. <laughs> how can our listeners Thank get you. a hold of you? So you can find me, how to get a hold on, of me. I mean, I'm not, I'm not hard to get in touch with. <laughs> so you, can, you can reach me by email, if you like, at jrabinowitz. Greg will spread, spell that out for you. jrabinowitz at weseedchange.org. You can find me on Instagram at Jane underscore Rabinowitz and look me up through uh, Seed Change at weseedchange.org. Nice, 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 nice. You can also find show notes from today's podcast at urbanfarm.org forward slash seed change. Hey, if you've enjoyed this podcast and are interested in listening to my first podcast series, Freshly Green from 2007, you can subscribe to support the Urban Farm podcast. With that, you will have access to Freshly Green and so much more bonus content. Visit urbanfarmpodcast.org to find out more and to pledge your support. We hope you enjoyed today's episode of the Urban Farm Podcast. Remember to listen for tips, advice, and resources to help you on your journey with urban farming. You can find us on the web at urbanfarm.org or send us an email to podcast at urbanfarm.org. In the words of Vincent Van Gogh, great things are done by a series of small things brought together. Be encouraged that with each lesson learned and skill developed, you are one step closer in the direction of your dreams.